everybody, and once again, I hope that everyone's been having a really enjoyable evening so far. And hopefully, it's not a terrible shock to anybody that I'm not doing the nearest. Uh, hopefully, everybody's fully expecting uh, that. And of course, um, it's a terrible shame that she's not able to join us this evening, but I'll do my very best to, to stop into her shoes and hopefully uh, deliver something interesting and enjoyable and luckily for me there has been quite a rich source of inspiration uh, over the last uh, let's say week or maybe the past few months because i wonder if anybody else has been aware of an event that transpired uh, over the weekend last uh, the matter of the coronation of his majesty uh, king charles iii so hopefully not escaped anyone's noticed um so that weekend involved an assemblage of events and displays that Scott, I'm sure, the lover as he was of all things spectacular and ceremonial, would have certainly relished. Indeed, Scott attended possibly the most extraordinary coronation in British history, that of George IV in July 1821. Reflecting on that occasion, Scott later wrote that those who witnessed it have seen a scene calculated to raise the country in their opinion and to throw into the, into the shade all scenes of similar magnificence from the field of the cloth of gold down to the present day. So much he would have found to wonder at here too in the ceremony of the last weekend there. That interestingly, if the ceremony of George IV's coronation was a ceremony of lasts, it was the last coronation banquet, uh, the last entrance of the king's champion into the banqueting hall, uh, the coronation we just witnessed of Charles III included a host of fasts, uh, the first female sword bearer and the first time that a Welsh language was included uh, in as part of the coronation ceremony. But something that these ceremonies had in common, and perhaps one aspect in particular that might have found Scott sitting at the edge of his seat to witness, was the tremendous role that object played in objects played in the coronation. Because coronations rely heavily upon objects, to name but a few of the many evolved, there's the coronation chair, the stone of destiny, the ancient anointing spoon, and of course the regalia, the orb, the sword, the scepter, the robes, the rings, and of course, crowns. There is in fact a rather spectacular thingness to coronations that the magpie, if I dare may say, in Scott would not have been able to resist. But to say that Scott loved living in a material world is not to say something new. We know that Scott saw the power, visual and narrative, in material things. Even as a young man, whilst he was still a resident of his father's house in George Square, his collecting of fragments had commenced. What began at George Square thrived and bloomed extraordinarily at Abbotsford, and Abbotsford became something of a dedicated exhibition space for curious all sorts, collected, curated, selected and sent to Scott across several decades. And as one might expect from one who was so moved by the pres presence of artefacts as to create a museum in his own home, in his imaginative world of fiction too, Scott compiled a curious collection of things ranging from entombed books to exhumed hearts, crucial documents and portentous prophecies, ancestral jewels and buried treasure. That Scott's novels rattled with antiquarian treasure was noted by a reviewer of Ivanhoe in Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine in December 1819. And they said that the opening narrative appears like a Curian antiquarian exhibition. Never were the long gathered stores of most extensive erudition applied to the purposes of imaginative genius with so much easy, lavish and luxurious power. Never was the illusion of fancy so complete made up of so many minute elements and yet producing such entireness of effect. But those curious collection of objects, the thrones, stones, swords and scepters, robes and rings of the coronation ceremony, these objects are not mere decoration. Rather they are objects that do. They confer, bestow, symbolise and witness. They are active agents in the ceremony and the coronation act as a whole. The objects which accumulate their power and potency from their interaction with humans, in other words, from their stories. And in Scott's youth, fiction was packed full of just such objects, a class of fiction that delighted in its own thingness, 
whether groaning suits of armour in Clara Reeve's Old English Baron, or the giant helmet of um, up a Walpole's castle of a Trancho, and the generally rattling, clinking, shaking and clutteredness of Gothic fiction altogether. Another class of fiction, perhaps less well known, were novels narrated from the perspective of an object, relating their fortunes and adventures, and an early uh, incarnation of this was Charles Gildon's The Golden Spy, first published in 1709, an account, as hinted in the title, narrated by a pocketful of gold coins. Other works followed, which sound a little less exciting to me, The Adventures of a Lady's Slippers, uh, The Adventures of a Halfpenny, and even The Adventures of a Watch. <laughs> Traversing along city streets, exchanged between the hands of merchants and nobles, resting upon an arm in a coffee shop or in a parliament, such objects were able, from their various vantage points, to offer either a simple account of all they perceived, or a critical view of the society in which they circulated. For rather than narratives which were actually about the coins, slippers, wigs, watches or shoes in question, these were objects that um, as Mark Blackwell has noted, they gathered traces of their owners and thus serve as narrative hubs around which others' stories <coughs> circulated. That Scott was impressed and interested by this mode of storytelling is gleaned by the fact that he edited and introduced perhaps the most successful of these it narratives, and that was a, a text called uh, Chrysal or the Adventures of a Guinea by Charles Johnston, and Scott edited that for the fourth volume of Ballantyne's Novelist's Library in 1821. And further than this, perhaps some of Scott's novels have something of the it narrative about them, concerning a central object, observing and relaying a collection of stories, just as those regalia items collect their significance from the stories that they accumulate. Take, for example, the 1818 novel, Heart of Midlothian. Now, as it's likely known in this room, in 1817, a new jail opened on Carlton Hill, rendering the antiquated, crumbling old Tolbooth redundant. The old prison was therefore demolished in the same year. Ever ready to salvage the fragments of the past, Scott acquired several relics of this building, the gigantic locks and stupendously sized keys still exhibited in his hallway at Abbotsford today and the old Tolbooth door, which he built into an external wall of his house. Devoid of its function, the old Tolbooth door rather fittingly offers no point of entry or exit, but remains as an aesthetic reminder of the many for whom this was the last door on earth to open. And as is the case in many of other of Scott's novels, object acquisition preceded narrative composition, and The Heart of Midlothian was published just one year after the demolition of the Tolbooth. Yet easily overlooked, a conversation in the introductory chapter of the novel presents the door itself as an accumulator of stories. When young lawyers Halkett and Hardy dwell upon the stories of the old stones of the prison, and I think by extension we can say old stones and the old door of the prison, and they conjecture, why should not the Tolbooth have its last speech, confession and dying words? The old stones will be just as conscious of the honour as many a poor devil who's dangled like a tassel at the west end of it. My last speech of the old Tolbooth should illustrate with examples sufficient to gorge even the public's all-devouring appetite of the wonderful and horrible. So Halkett and Hardy here consider the Tolbooth as a witness of history, contemplating the consciousness of the prison and its ability to communicate those stories to which it's been a witness. Just like the objects of it narratives of the preceding century, they gave witness to society around them, so too is the Tolbooth positioned as a narrative hub around which stories converge and gather. And indeed, in Scott's novel, the prison and its door are the literal and figurative threshold upon which we access the stories, many stories, of Wilson and Robertson, those ill-fated smugglers seeking to escape prison and imminent execution, of the Porteous riots and the subsequent execution of Porteous himself, and of the plight of Jimmy and Effie Deans. That these stories constitute a sort of curious exhibition in their own right is heavily implied in a further speech by those young lawyers, and this is where Hardy likens Scotland's moral landscape to a cabinet of curiosities to be examined and deciphered. So he says, 
Scotland is like one of her own highland glens, and the moralist who reads her who reads the records of her criminal jurisprudence will find as many curious anomalous facts in the history of the mind as the botanist will detect rare specimens among her dingles and cliffs. And it's a similar cabinet of stories which are collected in the heart of Midlothian, stories which converge around the site of the tollbooth, around the remaining thing, the prison door. Another example of the manner in which stories converge upon an object might be found in another of Scott's novels, The Antiquary. In this instance, the object isn't static, isn't a static witness like the tollbooth door, but rather an artifact which travels amongst the subjects of which it narrates. This object, like an object we heard of uh, earlier, is imbued with the spirit of gold and it's similarly exchanged from hand to hand to reveal fragments of narrative. It's a ring. Indeed, like the objects of it narratives before, this ring travels between the characters of the novel and in so doing weaves together their various secrets, testimonies and stories. According to the hand in which it sits, the ring tells a different tale and has a different tale told of it in turn. It is an item simultaneously matrimonial, evidential and commemorative. A gold band intertwined with hair is making up the central feature of the stone. And it means different things for different people. For the Earl of Glenallan, this is a wedding ring belonging to his lost, lost love, Evelyn Neville. It's her hair and his that intertwine below the ring's surface. Yet the ring is a painful memory for him. It presents to him his lost love and his loss and his guilt as well. For Elspeth Mucklebacket, the ring symbolises her treacherous part in a, in a deception orchestrated at the hand of the Countess of Glenallan. For Edie Ockletree, intermediary between these parties and amateur antiquarian, this ring is an item of value and much curiosity. But most interesting is what the ring makes each person do, lose or gain. For Edie Ockletree, it makes him take a journey to take the ring to the Glenallan estate. For Elspeth Mucklebacket, it produces a physical reaction, fear, trembling and furthermore, it forces a confession. For Glenallan, through the confession elicited by the ring, he himself loses his burden of guilt and gains a son and heir, Lovell. And Lovell thereafter, Lord Gerardin, loses the taint of illegitimacy and is restored to his ancestral seat. So the ring has a great deal of agency in losing, gaining, witnessing and eliciting. The point in all of this is that Scott uh, abundantly recognised the important role that artefacts could play in contributing to and unravelling narratives, thus uniting story and object. But Gothic-style plots interwoven with narrative-laden objects might be found beyond the confines of just Scott's fictions, and it's with an example of loss, recovery, narration and subsequent exhibition with which I want to draw to a close. It was upon their rediscovery in 1819, over 100 years since the sceptre of Scotland had performed its final duty and had been deposited in a strong chest in an uncertain location in Edinburgh Castle, along with the other items of the Scottish regalia. The regalia had been relocated upon numerous occasions for their safekeeping. They had been concealed within the walls of Donata Castle, had been buried beneath the floors of Kenneth Parish Church. Indeed, the tale of the honours of Scotland is one of loss, usurpation, kidnap, smuggling, concealment, internment, and eventual exposure. It seems like the tale of the Scottish regalia was a, a gothic plot of national proportions. Discontent with the tale sadly lacking in the objects of its interest, in 1818, Scott initiated a petition to the then Prince Regent to retrieve the honours, resulting in an expedition to the castle where the chest containing the regalia was discovered and opened. They had been so long lost and so long hidden from sight, Scott explained in his um, Provincial Antiquities, that the memory of the regalia became like that of a tale which had been told. That these were objects that no longer did, did not for Scott detract from the fact that they had done. The traces of all their doing had been transfigured into a tale that they could tell and continue to tell over 200 years since. 
And so, everybody, I invite you to raise a toast to Sir Walter Scott to lift our glasses as an act of objects that don't do him. Um, raising a toast to Scott's material world and to the world of his stories. And may the two ever continue to meet at, at Abbotsford in Edinburgh and in the Waverley novels. So, Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott.